Hello everyone and welcome to my top 10 favorite PS1 games of all time. Really quick, I just wanted to go over the one rule I had for this list and that was one entry per series. Although I made two exceptions in the video here, but you'll see what I mean when we get there in the list. Also, as a quick caveat, just keep in mind that this is my personal top 10 list and you might see some of your favorite games missing from the list, but chances are that I just haven't played them or it just wasn't quite good enough to make the cut. But that's kind of the whole point of this channel is I'm trying to tackle the backlog of the many, many fantastic PlayStation 1 games out there. And I thought that this list would be a great way to show you guys uh, where I'm at when it comes to my top 10 favorite games and maybe how it can change in the future once I knock some more games off of that huge backlog. Now that we have intros out of the way, let's get right into it with number 10, Chrono Cross, a pretty controversial GRPG that has always stood in the large shadow of its older brother, Chrono Trigger. But time has served this game well, no puns intended, and it seems more fans of the GRPG genre are starting to see this game in a different light. On its own merits, Chrono Cross is a fantastic game, with a unique take on RPG combat, massively large cast of usable characters, and a really exciting story with many twists and turns. This game starts to look a bit sour when talking about the really botched ending in my opinion and the weirdly loose tie-ins with Chrono Trigger. Without getting too far into it, everything was looking great story-wise when Chrono Cross was keeping to its own contained story, but when the story from Trigger starts looping in, things get extremely messy and confusing. Outside of the story in this game though, what did help the game age well was the removal of random encounters, just like in Chrono Trigger. Although another downside ends up coming from the large selection of characters, which I said was a benefit earlier. Having a lot of options for characters to pick from is fun, but most of them get no story bits and seem, honestly in my opinion, a bit soulless. The characters that do get more fleshed out side stories though end up being some of my favorite parts of the entire game. I do understand some people out there really like the collect them all aspect, but it really wasn't for me. All in all, the game is a bit of a mixed bag, which is why I end up sticking it at number 10 even though I really do love this game and enjoyed it a lot. Moving on to the number 9 spot, it goes to Parasite Eve, another Squaresoft GRPG, but this time with a horror twist. Now this game consistently gives some creepy vibes, which is pretty unique for its time. What really hooked me to this game though was the combat. It is sort of a mix between a real-time battle and turn-based RPG. The ability to move around to dodge enemy attacks while waiting for your turn to perform an attack yourself is an extremely fun and intense take on turn-based combat. I also like how when it is your turn to make a move, time stops, giving you a small breather to take in your surroundings and make the best decision possible, which is much more like a traditional turn-based RPG in that aspect. I really don't know what it is about this game, but it straddles that perfect line for me not going too far in either direction between turn-based combat and real-time combat that just feels perfectly right. The story is also a lot of fun to grow through and the only real downside I can see to this game is the weapons and upgrades that you go through can feel a bit linear as the game goes further and I don't really see any other flaws with the game which is the biggest reason it slots right above Chrono Cross. I do plan on doing a larger retrospective on this game in the future, so I'll save any extra comments for a video like that, but just know that I absolutely love this game and really look forward to talking about it a little more in depth. Moving on to number 8, we are finally taking a genre jump, going from JRPGs into arcade fighters with Tekken 3. 
This game is the perfect culmination of all the experience gained by the team from the previous two entries. Tekken 3 is by far the best and most polished 3D fighter of its era. As an amazing and interesting cast of characters, fantastic graphics for the time, and a banger soundtrack. The classic arcade mode in this game is perfect. On unlocking hidden characters while playing out your favorite character's final cutscenes in their story will always be a blast. The fluidity of the fighting in this game can feel divine when everything starts clicking together after a little bit of practice. But if the base gameplay didn't sell you on this game enough, Tekken 3 also has some of the most fun minigames as well, with Tekken Ball and Tekken Force. Tekken Force being my favorite of the two, it turns into a side-scrolling beat-em-up that, although can feel a little clunky at times, is a really fun distraction from the main game. Tekken Ball isn't anything to scoff at either, where players have to trade hitting a beach ball back and forth while being able to attack one another like normal. This game mode can become really intense and hectic, which is where it shines the most in my opinion. Tekken 3 outside of the combat isn't really much deeper than that, but it doesn't really need to be. Like I mentioned earlier, classic arcade mode is perfect, and I just love the combat in this game. It still to this day is probably the fighting game I come back to the most out of any other fighting game I've ever played, so that's why it had to make my top 10 list here. At the number 7 slot, we are changing genres once again to one of the best platformers on the console with Ape Escape. Now I'm sure as most of you know, this is the first PS1 game to require the DualShock controller for functionality, and although in my opinion the game maybe could have survived without it, that doesn't take away from what a fantastic platformer this game is. I will admit the controls do take a little getting used to, but when you lock in the extra maneuverability you get with the analog while swinging the net trying to catch monkeys, it can be just blissful. The game gives you plenty of gadgets to play around with, and it's a lot of fun finding and using them for all sorts of puzzles and different situations to assist in catching the monkeys. Being able to map the swapping of items to the face buttons can lead to some really slick monkey catching moments. The biggest downside of this game to me though is the backtracking. If people think Spyro 2 is some bad level backtracking, Ape Escape is on another tier entirely. Almost every single level needs to be returned to at a different time once you get multiple new gadgets. And I would say almost over half the game is spent getting and learning new gadgets. You are basically in tutorial mode for a long while until finally collecting all the gadgets. But then the game really opens up at that point and becomes a lot of fun. Now that's all not to say the game isn't enjoyable the whole way through, but it would be nice to be able to acquire the full set of gadgets a little sooner. All in all though, Ape Escape is a fantastic platformer and it's one that I always look forward to going back to. Speaking of platformers, Crash Bandicoot 3 makes it to number 6 on this list. It was a close toss up between Crash 2 and 3, and honestly, this is basically just nostalgia speaking, but I like Crash 3 a little bit better. Even though all the experimental levels kind of suck, like the bike riding, plane flying, and scuba diving, but outside of all of that, this feels like Crash Bandicoot at its best. The level themes and general fluidity of everything is kind of divine. I hate collecting the time relics, but you can tell most levels are built around speedrunning through them. Yes, the levels that aren't do really suck to run through, but I don't know. I guess the highs of this game are just the best of Crash Bandicoot for me. Crash 3 also has the best set of boss fights by far in my opinion, which makes running through the game much more enjoyable, where in Crash 2 the bosses are so simple it's basically just a formality to slog through. Crash is definitely the best, more traditional platformer the PS1 has by far, and there is a reason the franchise still goes on to this day. Moving on to number 5, this goes to Crash Team Racing. So this is the exception I was talking about earlier, technically it is a Crash game, but I figured it really doesn't count since it's a kart racer. 
and honestly, it's probably the best kart racer of its generation. Yes, even better than Mario Kart 64 or Diddy Kong Racing. Fight me in the comments if you want to. But seriously, this game feels fantastic to play. It has my favorite drifting mechanic of any racer, where I think it's pretty easy to grasp and learn, but very hard to master, which is always a sign of a good game in my opinion. The hub world is also this perfect little playground where you can practice your mechanics and unlock new tracks and areas to race around in. This all just adds a lot of charm to the game that I feel like Mario Kart is really missing. Outside of that, the tracks are also all extremely varied and, in my opinion, very well designed, with tons of fun and challenging shortcuts to discover, along with plenty of wide turns to really take advantage of this game's drifting mechanics. Honestly, when you get good at this game, it just feels like you're gliding on air. This game also offers plenty of other challenges during the campaign and some fun co-op competition to gnaw on just like in Mario Kart, giving plenty of hours worth of content. Now, for me, the biggest downsides to this game is the sort of small list of usable items. The boss fights, by and large, feel pretty uninspired, especially because every single one of the bosses has a pretty frustrating mechanic and tons of cheap rubber banding. But in the grand scheme of things, it really isn't so bad. The overall package here is fantastic though, and for anyone who has missed out, this has got to be one of the best kart racers ever. The number 4 slot finally goes back to another JRPG, and that is Final Fantasy IX. Now I'm sure you all were waiting for a Final Fantasy game to fall onto this list, and it might be kind of surprising that it is Final Fantasy IX instead of VII. Now this video isn't really the time or place to compare and contrast those two games, but there are so many things that I would like to say about Final Fantasy IX in particular. Perhaps I'll do a future video on this game, kind of like with Parasite Eve, where I'll try to collect all my thoughts, but to keep it brief here, this is probably my favorite Final Fantasy game of all time. The characters and the setting here are all just so charming. I get this extremely adventurous feeling while playing through the game that almost no other JRPG really gives me. The story is engaging. The secrets are fun to discover, and the combat is just as good as any other Final Fantasy game out there. The only knocks I really give to this game is the strict character classes. I do prefer the materia system of Final Fantasy VII or the job system of other previous Final Fantasy games like Final Fantasy Tactics, which gives a lot more character customizability. But for a newcomer, I think this simplified system is a lot more inviting. The other knock I have on this game is sort of related, where you have to power up using certain weapons to earn a new move you want. This can feel kind of awkward, especially if you need to use a low level item. Trying to grind out points with a really weak piece of armor or weapon can end up coming off as extremely tedious. This also kind of ties into getting these items that you need to learn certain moves that you want to get through the game a little bit easier. Almost every useful item you want to use early on in the game needs to be stolen. Luckily, the main character Zidane knows how to steal right from the beginning of the game. But often, you will need to attempt to steal the item for a very long time before getting it because of the poor drop rates which could feel like a huge time waster. Outside of those minor gripes though, overall, this is just such a fantastic game and story to play through. The ending portion does fall over itself a little bit, but honestly, most Final Fantasies do. And when you do beat the game, the ending just gives you the warmest feeling inside. The game can go from dark to cozy so quickly, it's, it's just amazing. Alright, enough oozing over Final Fantasy IX, let's move on to number 3. Which is Spyro the Dragon 2 Ripto's Rage. I'm sure many of you are shocked to see this game so high on my list. And truthfully, it's almost entirely nostalgia based. I have played through and 100% completed this game more times than I have fingers. I just absolutely love this game to the very core of my being. Entering the homeworlds like Summer Forest or Autumn Springs for the first time as a kid just 
filled me with such a warm, carefree, adventurous feeling that as an adult, I rarely ever get anymore. Coming back to this is so nostalgic for me and it still feels the same as it did back then and it just gives me so much emotion. The individual levels also all have a similar kind of charm to them with unique characters alerted throughout the game that Sparrow needs to save. Everything feels so much more lived in than most platformers for me. Finding secret little areas to discover hordes of gems or an orb is just so much fun. Most minigames are a great distraction and break from the regular gameplay cycle in my opinion, along with the flight stages. The biggest criticism I do have for this game is how tedious some of the minigames can be to complete. Truthfully, most individuals can just skip the annoying ones though if you just want to beat the game, but for completionists, this can be a big turnoff. I think the incredible boss fights do make up for this a little bit though. Outside of Crush, both Gulp and Ripto himself are a fun challenge to overcome with lots of unique mechanics to defeat them. Ripto having a three-tiered epic final showdown is the perfect way to cap off this entire experience. Honestly, this may not be the best platformer ever for most of you. But for me, it is, and I just couldn't force myself to slide the game any lower. At number 2, we have another rule breaker with Final Fantasy Tactics. This, once again, is kind of a different genre though, being a tactical RPG, so for me, it gets a pass. Although, it's sort of straddling that line a little bit more. This game is unbelievably addicting. The amount of character customization Final Fantasy Tactics offers is almost endless. It's hard to describe just how many countless hours I poured into assembling my team while playing through this game. Doing research on all the different class trees and piecing together the best combinations of classes to see what sort of cool mechanics you can get out of mixing them is brain meltingly entertaining. Now although I love this game, it is probably one of the most flawed on this list. When playing through the campaign, the story can be pretty cryptic and some extremely, extremely unfair difficulty spikes crop up, including one fight where if you aren't expecting it and properly equipped, you'll be locked into a failure loop, forcing you to restart the entire game unless you created a save before the battle started. These issues aside, the tactical combat is just so engaging along with the unbelievably diverse team building. All the downsides for me just kind of get swept under the rug. If you're a fan of the tactical RPG genre, what are you guys waiting for? This is one that you really can't miss out on. Number 1. Metal Gear Solid. Most of you probably saw this coming. It makes almost everyone's top 10 list in some way or another. Metal Gear Solid isn't only my favorite PS1 game, but it's my favorite video game of all time. It kickstarted an entire genre single-handedly, gave me some of the most fun, arcadey stealth action that I still think hasn't been done the same since this game was released. Learning all the guard movements and being able to quickly and slickly run through each area of this game just feels amazing. And don't even get me started on the story, I could ramble about all the little intricacies going on and how all the games tie in together, but that probably belongs in an entirely separate video much, much longer than this one. Just know that if you haven't experienced this story, this is the closest I ever felt to playing as a true Hollywood James Bond hero. All the characters and the voice acting is just so charming in this game and perfectly campy especially the memorable bosses. Metal Gear Solid just has so many emotional and exciting beats. I used to sit for hours just going into a new area and calling everyone on the codec multiple times just to hear all the unique different kinds of dialogue. This game, for me, truly is a classic in every sense of the word, and for me, is by far the best the PS1 has to offer. But with all that being said, that's the list everyone. Let me know what you agree and disagree with in the comments. Do keep in mind, again, that if your favorite game didn't make the list, I genuinely haven't played all the PS1 games that the PlayStation had to offer, and will more than likely update this video with whatever new games I get to experience in the future. I would really love any kinds of recommendations for games you guys can give me. 
last thing here I just wanted to thank you all for watching the video today it was a lot of fun getting to talk about my favorite games with y'all and I hope to see you come back for another video